We're on. We're live. This is Republican Men's Club in Reno, Nevada at the Atlantis. I'm Ray Roach. I'm president of the Republican Men's Club. And we have a great lineup uh, this evening. It's been sponsored, as you see on the board, by one of the cable networks. And we do have, for any of you business owners, for $75 or so, you can be a sponsor on our website. With that in mind, we'll try to get ahead a little bit. We're on. We're aligned. It gives me great pleasure. We have two constitutional state officers here. The first one to speak will be Dan Schwartz, our state treasurer. I'm sure he has some interesting comments, and I know the legislature kind of had some interesting comments on him. Dan, welcome. Hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Not so close. Good. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, uh, I greatly appreciate the invitation to speak, and thank you all uh, uh, in the men's club. Um, I'm going to talk about three topics, but before I do, uh, two sort of preliminary notes. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with my colleague, Ron. Um, we don't do things exactly the same way. But as you all know, when you travel with someone for three days locked up in a car, you begin to develop a certain empathy and uh, knowledge of the other person. So uh, Ron and I have done that, and um, we've, we've worked together on the budget. And uh, uh, as, as Ron will say and would say, your money's in good hands. Um, <laughs> uh, second of all, I want to thank all of you. Um, we had a great victory in November. And I'll, I could say it's because we had great candidates. Yep, okay. Uh, it's because all of us worked hard, but Ron and I and the other officers know that the real reason we won was because of you. You got out, you knocked on go doors, you made phone calls, and you put us in office. So a real heart heartfelt thank you to all of you. Uh, second of all, I will be very brief, just tell you a little bit about the state treasurer's office. Uh, we've really got a full plate. We are working on investments. Uh, we've already, this is a small amount, but we've, we've actually gotten the rate of return up by 10 or 20 basis points. We're going to do a lot better than that. Um, we've got a micro loan program that we're working on. Uh, we've got a private equity program that we're uh, pivoting on, uh, and this will all redound to the benefit of the state. Um, we issue debt for the state. Uh, we deal with unclaimed property. If, if you turn to these huge lists in the newspaper, a long list, you can barely read it. It's all money that belongs to you, and we want to give it back to you. So take a look at those lists. Um, finally, and this is going to be one of our major initiatives, the state treasurer oversees the college scholarship and um, prepaid tuition programs. This is a huge program. Uh, we're going to put it all under one um umbrella and we're going to call it Let's Go to College. Uh, as one of our, our board members said, what this state is lacking is a real culture of education. And um, we can certainly agree with the governor on that, but we're going we're gonna to really work hard to make that uh, a reality. Um, I want to talk about three things uh, for the main body of my speech. Uh, the first of all um, is that you know uh, that I proposed an alternative budget, and uh, <laughs> okay. uh, we took some grief for that. Uh, I want to just give you some of the bare essentials on that, so that you can you can get it from the horse's mouth or the elephant's mouth. But um, it's it's a good budget, um, and um, I think it makes sense. Second, I want to talk to you a little bit about the politics in Carson City. Uh, these are things that you may not know, but uh, those of us there know them, and they're worth repeating. And then finally, as sort of the uh, dessert, I want to offer you some of Schwartz's predictions as to what's going to happen. Now, I don't have a crystal ball, but uh, and you can write them down, and you can give me a call in a month or so and say, you're Dan, you're right or you're wrong. Um, first of all, a, a, a thumbnail outline of the budget. Um, we currently have about a, and by the way, these numbers were taken from a presentation that was made to our office. Uh, as you know, the state 
has retained its credit rating. Uh, one senator in particular uh, tried to raise the issue that somehow I would be responsible for our losing our credit uh, rating. Uh, needless to say, we didn't, and uh, I haven't heard from him since. But, um, nor should I, uh, and it wasn't Roberson. Um, uh, the current budget is about $6.3 billion. Uh, the governor wants to increase that to $7.3 billion. So that's roughly about a billion dollars in tax increases. Um, new programs are about $900 million. Uh, sort of continuing some of the old programs or expanding them is about $100 million. Uh, he proposes to fund that um, with about $539 million in continuing the sunset taxes. Uh, his business license fee is about $438 million. Um, and then he actually has a mining tax of about $14 million, a slot tax, which is a, a gaming tax of about $40 million, and then a cigarette tax of $78.3 million. So it, it, it roughly balances to about a, a billion dollars in increased taxes. Um, his new programs are about $900 million. And uh, as you know, the, there was kind of a Broadway show or sort of something that was really ex party in the state Senate. But there's really a lot in the governor's budget that um, educate, the governor's right, we need to get education on track in the state. I have absolutely no arguments about that. Our office is in the forefront of doing that. But the question that I raised was whether in fact the governor's budget did that and whether in fact the amounts that he was suggesting really did did that. And I can give you some examples. Um, $78 million for full day kindergarten. Well, there's some question as to whether full day kindergarten is affected. Again, I'm not gonna comment on that, but these are, these are uh, uh, known facts. Uh, he has uh, $48.4 million for digital devices for K to 12. Uh, you and I know that if we give spend $48 million on iPads and uh, uh, iPhones and whatever, um, th these, these devices uh, are probably going to be stolen, they're going to be lost, they're going to be traded away. Why, why do we really want to do this? Um, he has another $36.2 million for social workers. Again, I'm not opposed to spending money on autism. I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't worry about bullying. Um, but w to me, education is about great teachers and parental involvement. And I just don't, thank you, yeah. Um, I, I just question whether the governor's budget does that. Um, let me just quickly uh, suggest wh what, what I proposed um, is I think the governor does need to re-examine his budget. Uh, I had loosely suggested that he cut about $400 million from this budget. And how he does that and how the legislature does that um, is certainly up to them. And, and what the governor's budget has also done is it's opened the floodgates. In other words, that, uh, for example, uh, Senator Aron Ford, who's uh, the minority leader, wants to take care of student debt. And Senator Ford says there's, I think, $7.2 billion in student debt in, in this state. Well, I think that's a good cause. I mean, um, but, but the governor doesn't really reflect that in his budget. Shouldn't we be concerned about that as much as we're concerned about giving, handing out digital devices? Uh, what I had proposed was roughly, um, I, I suggested continuing the sunset taxes. I know Chuck Muth would probably um, uh, throw a fit, but they, they're not new taxes. They've been around, people are paying them. But what I did suggest is that we take out $70 million for business licenses. I don't think that that the businessmen of this state, um, and, and it's mostly on the small businessmen and business women, um, they shouldn't have to pay $100, $400 and more just to open the doors in the morning. Uh, I'm, I'm very much opposed to the business license fee. That's $437.5 million. That should be taken out. Uh, the mining MBT, uh, about $15 million, I would take that out too. And the reasoning is whether you agree with these taxes or not, we as Nevadans just voted against them. We, we voted against the gross margins tax. Uh, why is this there? Uh, same thing with the mining tax. I mean, I live in, in, I have a place in Carson now, but 
my main home is in Las Vegas, uh, I can read the, the poll results. We voted against changing uh, the mining tax. Um, for all you smokers, I think we should continue the cigarette tax. And uh, I actually think uh, I don't have a problem with the slot tax. In fact, I actually suggested it during the campaign. And uh, one, uh, one columnist who now has his TV show back sort of looked at me in horror. Is how can you propose a tax against the entertainment industry? Uh, it's very simple. They make about $25 billion in, in revenue every year. Uh, asking them to pay $100 million to me doesn't seem like a, a huge, huge uh, burden. So that's kind of the, the alternative budget. Um, I also suggested, uh, I initially suggested uh, uh, that we look at a facilities fee at McCarran in Reno Tahoe. Uh, at, uh, it was my bad. Uh, I looked at the state statutes and uh, the federal statutes actually prohibit that. Uh, and instead, I actually proposed another tax, which I think is a pretty good one, which is a hotel, restaurant, bar uh, point of sales tax. That every time you buy a burger or a Starbucks or uh, a steak meal, there's a quarter added to your, your bill. That's not 25%, it's 25 cents. And I think that's it's a fair tax. Uh, we get about 50 to $60 billion in, in revenue uh, from people who visit our state, who use our facilities, asking them to pay a quarter for every, every food or beverage item in a casino. Uh, and, and the legislature can uh, obviously can change this instead of it's for every uh, point of sales over $2 or $3, but it's, it's a tax that's out there. Okay, so much for the alternative budget. I think it's reasonable. Uh, what are the political chances of of anything happening in Carson City. Uh, I can tell you um, that in terms of there are six constitutional officers, uh, Ron, myself, and Adam, I think, have come out and said we're opposed to the governor's proposed budget. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, two others, uh, and one other, obviously, the governor wants his budget. So, so that's two others. They shall remain nameless, but one of them congratulated me on keeping the sunset taxes. I know some of you are opposed to that, but he said absolutely nothing about the business license fee. Um, the other one kind of begged off and said I hadn't read anything. So at best, there's, there's three opposed, more likely five. Um, I've been told that in the, uh, uh, the Senate that, that uh, there are at least two or three Republican senators who are opposed to the governor's tax, okay? Um, I have been told that in the assembly um, that the governor will get zero Democratic votes and is likely to have about 20 Republican votes against him. This is what I've been told. It's hearsay, but that's kind of the, the, the chat that's, uh, that's going around. So the question then becomes, um, what's going to happen uh, this week and, and what's going to happen uh, uh, in the weeks ahead. Um, and these are my predictions. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, I think uh, those of you who are James Michener or, uh, I don't know, who wrote the Samurai? Was that Michener? Or, uh, uh, Honorable Sapuku. I think the, uh, the governor, I think, is, is, when I have a problem, I try to solve it. I think, and again, I respect the governor. I like the governor. But Apparently, the governor is going to double down on his problem. I think he will testify in favor of his business license fee tax. Um, I think that he will not, I think that he will lose. Uh, he may win in the Senate. I think it has no chance in the Assembly. Um, what is likely to happen, again, what I've heard, and I'm, I'm not expressing uh, support or otherwise, is that uh, uh, the sort of uh, uh, lifesaver will be an increase in the MBT. It's now about 1.7%. It will be increased to 2% across the board. Uh, I, I, my prediction on that is 50-50. Um, but I think uh, I would love them to see them take the, the hotel restaurant uh, tax, uh, point of sales tax. I don't know that it will be considered. But, um, and, and the real question is whether the governor actually cuts his budget. That, that uh, I can't... Uh, uh, my prediction on that is he may be forced to. Um, I think that's it. Um, I thank you all uh, for uh, having me and listening to me. Uh, we now have a great speaker coming up. My uh, my 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 friend and colleague uh, 
Ron Connect, and we'll obviously be available for questions afterwards. Thank you very much. I'm Ron Connect, and I'm one plain speaking nerd. <laughs> And I want to thank Dan Schwartz for giving my speech, and I'll sit down now and or take your... Seriously, it's great to be back with you all. Uh, what Dan said about you all won the election for us, you carried us to victory, is so true, and we couldn't be more grateful. Uh, thank you all for doing that. <clears throat> Let me tell you real briefly a little, a few stories about those four constitutional officers that you elected, each of whom has a portfolio, the Secretary of State, the Attorney General, the Treasurer, and myself as Controller. I'm going to start with Dan Schwartz, and yes, we're a couple of small town boys from Illinois, uh, so if, if you are dissatisfied with what you see, you can lay it off to that, okay? Um, Dan Schwartz meets the first day after, I think it was actually inauguration day. I did it the next morning with my staff, but he met with his managers and uh, they said, well, we presume that you don't want us to schedule events or uh, big things or meetings or anything with you on Friday. Dan looked really puzzled and he said, why is that? And they said, well, your predecessor was never in on Friday. Dan thinks for a second, and being a really smart guy, he went to Princeton and Columbia and stuff. He says, Republicans work on Friday. Schedule what you want. Adam Laxalt comes in. Um, not a man of many words, fair bit of action. <clears throat> He um, filed, he joins 26, seven other states uh, in filing suit against the Obama administration. <clears throat> and let me be real clear about this, and this goes for Adam too, <clears throat> it goes for all of us. Nobody loves legal immigrants the way we do. God bless them all and more of them. <laughs> It's not, it's not about legal immigrants. It's not about not loving immigrants. We do. Barbara Sagafsky, and I, I tell you this because I want you to understand something of what Dan said about the nature of the people that are doing the work. And you should begin to pick up a, a common thread here. Barbara Sagafsky is talking to her staff early on, and they said, how shall we address you? And she said, what are you talking about? Well, your predecessor wanted to be called Mr. Secretary of State. And she said, Barbara will do just fine. Thank you. Okay. So then we come to this guy, Connect, and he's talking to his management team, and uh, the issue of how to address him comes up. And so I said, well you got two choices. You can call me Ron, which everybody does, or if you don't want to call me Ron, Your Excellency will do just fine. In that first meeting, the morning after Inauguration Day, I told our people that the emphasis, and this is in the agenda, it's in the minutes, the emphasis is on continuity, it's on taking care of the basic business, okay? Uh, that's what's in common with Dan. He tells you the details. We're such nerds, we're so boring that you all sit there and listen to it and you take it, okay? But we're doing what we think you want, which is taking care of the basic business. Now, thank you. While we're doing that, Dan's out running amok with an alternate budget proposal that I helped on, and um, 
he took all the arrows for. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. Um, I'm writing, as I promised, when I talked to you all last time, a monthly controller's report, and you've each got the first two on your table. The first one addresses spending. My gosh, public spending. What a subject. The second one addresses revenues. I want to remind you sort of of where we all come from. Me, Dan, well, again, we're a couple of small town boys from Illinois, but all of us. Um, you know, Dan and I are getting old enough now that we can say that we grew up shortly after the fall of Rome. Um, seriously, uh, I was born in 1949, and there were two boys' names that were really popular that year. Ronald, for some or other actor, and Robert, for another actor. My mother chose the right one. Oh. So, if you look at my resume, if you look at Dan's, you see a couple of guys with solid professional uh, and business backgrounds and public service backgrounds. And I, of course, have the perfect wife, daughter, and mother-in-law at home, um, and the perfect mom back in the Midwest. And you might ask the question, and people did, so why would you want to be Nevada controller? Well, I'll tell you, and frankly, this is a little bit personal, but you're friends and I can share this with you. Growing up in a small town in Southern Illinois in the 1950s and going to high school there in the 60s, I dreamed of being Nevada State Controller. <laughs> From there, I went downhill. I was a Goldwater guy in 64 as a sophomore in high school. Yeah. Thank you, Ralph. May, it's good to see you. God bless you. She was a Goldwater girl, too. Um, but it was the 60s and 70s. And four years later, I came back to uh, my parents' house wearing a Gene McCarthy button. I had kind of gone off the end. Um, it went downhill further from there. Uh, I became a Democrat liberal, ran for the Urbana City Council, and, and here's the great news. There is a God because I ran as a liberal Democrat, and I lost by 12 votes. Can you imagine what a depraved existence it would have been if I had worked and won that election? Uh, I became a Naderite, a Linskyite, a uh, consumer environmental wacko liberal activist. Actually worked with some of the people uh, in that Chicago organization that later spawned uh, some guy named Obama as their uh, political standard bearer. And then I really went to the bottom. I dropped out of grad school in 78 and I went to California to be a minor cog in the first Jerry Brown administration <laughs> as a commissioner's senior advisor at the Energy Commission. Uh, pretty soon, pretty soon, I realized, I, I thought I had died and gone to heaven, okay? Pretty soon I realized that the bad guys, I was in regulation at the time, the bad guys, the regulated firms and businesses and executives, Actually, they were pretty tame, and I could handle them on my own. But when I really got to know the Democrat liberal regulators, I said, Lord, please protect me from these so-called good guys, the bad guys I can handle on my own. That was the beginning of wisdom. I continued to read and learn and grow. And, by the way, Dan and I are both champions of education. You know I spent the last eight years on the Board of Regents, and I care about education because I have a 13-year-old daughter who's in seventh grade, uh, but I care about it anyway. I actually went back to graduate school, and here's the one that's the hardest to believe of all. Graduate work at Stanford actually helped turn me into a limited government conservative, limited government libertarian conservative. 
Now, if I had gone to Berkeley, it would have been a different thing. So, um, I was misspending my 30s and 40, 40s as a single yuppie in the San Francisco Marina. I got involved with the Republican Party. We met in a phone booth uh, in, in San Francisco. And um, I finally, you know, I continued to learn and grow, became a limited government libertarian. Oh, went to law school and was the founder of the Federalist Society chapter at my law school in San Francisco. Coming around slowly, finally, finally, I grew up and got married at 49. And a few years later, as our daughter was about to be born, Kathy, who had been, we were then living in Silicon Valley, Kathy, who had been born and raised in Silicon Valley and never known anything else, finally agreed we had enjoyed as much of California as we could stand. And my mother-in-law, who lives with us, said, well, I don't particularly want to go, but if you all want to, I won't stand in your way. I didn't give him a chance to think twice. We came here. We found heaven on the sane side of the Sierra, and we moved in 2001, and I got active in Republican politics right away, became one of the mean 15. We stopped. The mean 15 stopped the gross receipts tax, and I'm proud as hell of that. Here's the upshot. You can talk all you want about compassion. You can babble about redistribution and all of this other stuff. But at the end of the day, as my columns and the controller's reports report to you, what's important is fostering economic growth. Now let me be a nerd for a second. If we have the kind of economic growth that we've known for the last three, 250, 300 years in Western civilization, and especially that we all grew up with after World War II until the 70s, each generation is literally twice as well off as its parents' generation. Literally twice as well off. And you can see that my mother was a barefoot, Dust Bowl, Depression-era Kansas farm girl. They lost the farm in the Depression, etc. My daughter is living the life that I wish I had lived, okay? I'm trying to do everything I can for her. And as soon as I get here, finished here tonight, I'm going to go home and help her with her homework. That's every night. But if you have the excess of government, government excessive spending, excessive taxing, excessive regulation, you slow down, and we've done this. And again, the controller's report actually shows you the data, shows you the, gives you the references, et cetera. What has happened is we've slowed down to where we now have 1% per person annual growth. And what that means is that my daughter's generation will only be a little bit better off. If, for example, if, for example, you have a family income, modest one of 60000 if you have that kind of growth that we had classically, the next generation would have 120000 But if you have what the Obama administration and the Democrat liberals and the status have brought us these last few years and decades, they would only have two-thirds as much, 80000 instead of 120000 I submit that's why Dan Schwartz, Ron Connect, Barbara Sagasky, Adam Laxalt, that's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why you elected us. That's why you all are good Republicans is because, yes, it's about education, but it's about fostering economic growth, about fostering freedom, prosperity, and opportunity so that our children truly can have the advantages we had. That's what we're about, and God bless you all for it. Um, with that... Dan Schwartz will take your questions. He was looking at the clock, pounded right off on Dan. What we want to have you do, we want plenty of time, and I believe tomorrow at 1 o'clock the governor is presenting his budget to the Senate. 
So you're encouraged to go down there if we agree or disagree. The only comment I have is nobody seems to talk about except Dan, maybe Ron, about how about, I was in management consulting, how about cutting costs? They never talk about that. It's always spend. I know Ron's, I read it. And anyway, I want you to stand up here uh, so he can get it on the uh, thing. Please ask questions to these guys. They're prepared. They want your questions. Please come up here. Who's first? Ken? I think this is on. Sounds like I'm on. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming. I know this whole room is on your side. Uh, Dan, you keep talking about taxes. You know, that's about the most ugly word, I think, in the English language. And uh, as Ray stole my thunder, reducing costs. I think that that brings us to where Ron is, is if you want economic growth, you can't do it if you're going to sustain or increase taxes. So you said that the sunset tax is here to stay, uh, and I believe it is, I really do. We have become accustomed to that. We're like uh, frogs in the water. You just keep heating it up a little bit at a time and suddenly we were boiled. So the sunset tax is here uh, and we need to do something else. So I know you work very hard and I appreciate the budget you put out, but what are you gentlemen working towards as to reducing costs? We need to get the amount of government down and then we can see growth so that that young child can look at something more than what her dad got. Uh, Ron's going to respond after I am, but um, I'll rebut him. him, yeah. Uh, um, you know, at the end of the day, government is about compromise, and uh, I think we're seeing where govern where where elected officials are unwilling to compromise. And if you look at Washington D.C., that is uh, Exhibit States Exhibit A. Um, the budget that I proposed. Uh, was an attempt to accommodate the governor, uh, but also to take a realistic view of what he had proposed. And uh, I kind of, I, I split, I took a Solomonic uh, approach and I kind of split the baby. And I said, okay, governor, um, we're all for education. We all need, we all know we need education. If that's what you want to do, we're willing to give you an additional 500 million, which is about which is what the sunset taxes are. But you need to cut 500 million. And that's, and, and especially you need to cut 500 million if you don't have a funding source and the um, business license fee is to me not a legitimate funding source. So um, I think that we as a state, I mean, there's some larger issues here. You know, what is the role of the state? And, and this is not something we're gonna <coughs> decide tonight. Um, should the state be building infrastructure? In other words, uh, I've been fortunate to live in other countries. I've lived in Hong Kong, I've lived in, uh, in Europe, and they have spent money on infrastructure. They have great transportation systems, they have great airports, and if you build it, they will come. I mean, if you look at whether it's Japan with the Shinkansen, Hong Kong has a fabulous airport, uh, they just keep growing. And we keep spending our money on consumables. And I, I don't want to sound negative on Medicare or autism, but we can't continue to do this, and I think Ron kind of touched on this, and expect to have a society and a civilization that grows and uh, produces the, the, the quality of life that uh, I think we're all accustomed to. So it's not a totally satisfactory answer, but at least hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from. Actually, my friend McSchwartz, this being St. Patrick's Day, uh, sells himself a bit short. Uh, he did a great job with his pass at the budget, and uh, the truth is that things are still going on behind the scenes, and we're both working with people across the quad 
at the legislature, you know, those 63 smartest people in the state. Uh, we're working with them to try to craft another alternative budget package uh, alter with reduced spending and uh, therefore reduced costs, Ken, and, and uh, perhaps ob certainly obviating the margins tax. And by the way, let's not call that a business license fee. Carol Bellardo of the Nevada Taxpayers Association uh, pointed out that it's a tax, okay? When you charge every business $100 to register them and that covers the cost, that's a fee, right? When you say, oh, well, it's going to be somewhere between $400 and $4 million per firm, depending on how much you make, that's no longer a fee, that's a tax. And it takes a two-thirds uh, vote. <laughs> and McShorts is right. Uh, there ain't going to be two-thirds for that. Uh, I talked in this room a few weeks ago to the Society of CPAs, and you should hear their reports as uh, private practice CPAs and as corporate CPAs. Uh, you should hear their reports of what it will do to their businesses. It's a terrible idea. So we're working on that. Uh, let me just, again, quote the controller's first two monthly reports. Here's the key fact. Even after you allocate enough to cover inflation, allocate enough to cover population growth and headcount growth among students and healthcare uh, clientele, et cetera, even after you take care of all of that, in the last 10 years, Nevada state spending has, in addition to all of that, grown 10% in real terms. Have your budgets grown like that? No, this is 10% higher than your budget, okay? And the revenues have grown about 9 or 10% also. I submit that tells us we have a spending problem, not a revenue problem. <laughs> So I'll stop haranguing and preaching and take another question. Hi. Oops. Um, I'd like to ask about the rate of return assumption for the PERS pension plan. Um, I believe California just lowered theirs and it's lower than ours. And also if you could talk about PERS in general. Thanks. I'll be happy to start with that and then I'll let the treasurer follow up. <clears throat> just so you know, uh, I've been a state employee half of my career and Someday, you know, and I'm getting there now, I'm getting a little bit older. Remember what Ronald Reagan said when he was about my age? When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and I know because I was there. <laughs> no, seriously, uh, I'll be a PERS beneficiary someday. Uh, I've spent the last eight years on the Board of Regents where I was active on the investment committee dealing with that kind of stuff. Dan's a great investor and an entrepreneur. We know investments. Uh, here's the deal with PERS. Um, it's underfunded. Now there's a shock. You basically get politicians and union heads whether it's in the private sector or the public sector saying we've got a defined benefit program and nobody wants to take the heat, especially among the politicians or the corporate board members, for saying, well, we'll find the revenues out of current revenue sources to pay you more. So what they do instead is they make all kinds of promises that they have no intention, or excuse me, they have no intention to keep because they won't be around to keep them, but future generations will be obligated to keep those promises in terms of higher benefits, okay? They don't fund those benefits like they ought to. Remember what I said about the slow economic growth? The slow economic growth that we've come to over the decades and that's been accelerated by the blowout of the last seven, eight years uh, also means slow or low returns on investment, okay? So we have an accelerating problem that we need to deal with. Even if you recognize that you should use that risky rate of return, the expected return on investment, it's lower. And so we're getting further and further behind. 
we need to stand up, we need to step up and face that, and we basically need to do in the, pro in the public sector what the private sector has done, which is get out of the business of defined benefit programs because it just leads to people making promises that will burden our children and their children, and we need to get into 401k and defined, uh, defined contribution plans. Now speaking in rebuttal is Dan Schwartz. <laughs> uh, thanks, Russ. So let's talk about PERS. Um, PERS, um, there, there's political reality and financial reality, okay? First, I'm going to talk about financial reality. Uh, where's the oh, yeah, U.S. question? Um, first, PERS is 30% uh, underfunded. What does that mean? It means that it's 70% funded. 30% uh, is not funded. How much is 30%? It's about a minimum of about $12 billion, $12.5 billion. Uh, you mentioned the rate of return. Um, this, the rate, and again, I don't want to get too complicated, but the rate of return um, is, is an average rate that PERS makes on its investments. Okay. Um, California has, has uh, uh, become more realistic, and they have reduced the rate of return, I think 7.5% is what you said, which I think is what it is. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, and again, I don't want to get into complex financial calculations, but the rate of return defines the amount of the unfunded liability, and it's an inverse relationship. I, I'm going to keep it very simple. So the higher the rate of return, the lower the unfunded liability. Okay, so if we lower that rate of return, then we have a higher unfunded liability. Okay. So what is the true unfunded liability of Nevada PERS? Uh, if you take a reasonable rate of return, it's probably about 15 or $16 billion. Who cares? Okay. Well, we should care. Um, we, have, we've, we actually, uh, there's a bill now uh, in which we're asking the state treasurer to be a member of the PERS board. Okay, uh, we're having some issues with the committee chairman because uh, I don't want to get into Carson City politics, but there was another bill that suggested that the board be increased. That bill was not, um, was not successful. And all we've said in our bill is that the taxpayers of the state are stakeholders in PERS. Why is that? Because there's 12 to $16 billion of money that if PERS doesn't cover it, we, the taxpayers, must cover it. So we should be represented. Now, PERS's stance is, I call it Fortress PERS, and they don't, they don't recognize that. What they look at, and this is political reality, is they've had a couple of great years. Anyone who's been an investor has done well. I think this past year they earned 17%, the year before they earned 12%. So they're saying, remember the old mad, you know, what me worry? Why are you bothering me? We're successful. Well, that's fine. Maybe you are, but unless you want to take over that 12 to $15 billion, and I haven't seen any of the PERS beneficiaries raising their hands to do that, the Nevada taxpayers should be on the PERS board. So that's, and, and then there's, there's other issues, but what, what I've simply said is PERS may be the smartest investors in the world, but we, the taxpayers, should be represented, and the state treasurer is the person that who should do that. So I, if that answers part of your question, um, there are systemic issues there, and they will not be solved unless we get someone there who is not. Uh, they, one of the complaints is, well, Dan, your fiduciary duty is not to the beneficiaries of PERS. And I've said, you're absolutely right. My fiduciary duty is to you. So, thank you. OK. For the record, get Gary Schmidt, and this question is specifically for His Excellency. <laughs> and let me say that myself and Larry Green and Carol Feinberg and the NPRI are invited weekly for a lunch meeting in His Excellency's office to discuss current legislative actions. And he does really insist on us calling that. Not, not. <laughs> My question is, are you 
ready here this evening to announce your candidacy in 2018 against Mark Hutchison or Dean Heller for the Republican nomination for governor of the state of Nevada. Thank you. Now he gave away, he gave away the location. Well, he didn't tell you the exact date. It's every Monday at noon um, of the meeting of the vast right-wing conspiracy. That's the way it appears on my calendar in the office, okay? Vast right-wing conspiracy meets here today. Uh, Larry Green is often there, Gary Schmidt, Carol Feinberg, a few others, are, uh, a few other reprobates are there with us. Um, I'm doing one thing. I was elected state controller and I'm working to make sure, just like I told you, continuity, taking care of the business. Yes, it's a bully pulpit, and I will continue to use it as a bully pulpit. But what I want to do is make you proud. You elected me controller. My expectation is I'll be running for re-election, uh, but it's way too early to worry about any of that. Let's take care of business like Dan is doing. and. Then we'll see what options are open. I will add one more thing. I told you about my journey from the dark side, right, to the light that we all stand in here tonight. There's an old Nevada saying, and I was going to use this tonight because I'm talking to a men's club, and so they would understand sort of how it is I have such a sharp, aggressive edge in favor of limited government, libertarian, conservative principles having made this journey. There's this old Nevada saying that nobody sings louder in the church choir than the reformed whore. <laughs> but, Caroline reminded me that there are a lot of women in the audience tonight, and so I can't say that. So now we're going to clean this up and say, nobody sings louder in the church choir than the reformed libertine. And politically, that's me. What I'm going to do is continue to do the job you elected me to. And uh, we'll worry. Let's get through defeating, getting rid of Obama, defeating Hillary, defeating Elizabeth Warren, waving goodbye to Joe Biden. Let's all come together and win in 2016, and then we can fight, uh, excuse me, then we can talk about what we all do in 2018. Thank you all. We're, we're going to have one more question, but we'll have questions afterwards, and you have to say because we have three drawings. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, my question is for the treasurer, Dan. And uh, we spoke earlier, and this is a rehash of the first question. Why are we not cutting the budget that we have right now before increasing taxes? My point being, a high school costs $85 million, according to our previous speaker. Middle school costs $50 million. Elementary school costs $25 million. And yet 15 years ago, Galena High School was, was built for less than 20, I think cost $12 million. Real wages have not gone up. There is a big disparity of income in our country. But when somebody makes less income, you cut your budget. You don't increase taxes. So please try to give me a more concrete answer. <laughs> um, Let's not, let's not uh, confuse private businesses and governments. Uh, uh, this is the answer to your question. And of course, budgets are not only financial uh, statements, they're political statements. And when we put together a budget, we're making a political statement. Um, how many of you are uh, private businessmen here? Or were? Okay, were. Well, uh, you know that when you're, um, you want to expand your business. You, if you don't have the revenue, you can't do it. Okay, so therefore, you stagnate. Okay, and 
anyone who's run a business doesn't want to stagnate. So you decide how are you going how how are you going to be able to accomplish the growth that you want uh, without it, it, in an environment where your revenues are stable or they're flat. So you, you there's one of two things you can do. You can borrow. I mean, this is how businesses grow. Uh, or you can come out with better marketing plans or better business plans. So you have the ability to expand your business. Okay. Um, government, uh, aside from the treasurer's department, we actually uh, cover about 90% of our uh, expenses through our own, through various fees that we have. Governments can only grow by increasing taxes, and that's a reality. Now we can, we can cut taxes, and as I said, I've suggested that we cut, you know, somewhere, or that the governor look to cut something like four to five hundred million dollars from his proposed budget. But um, I want to see Nevada grow, and the only way for it to grow is to, sadly, increase taxes. Now. Um, we can cut expense. I mean, there's again different businessmen have different philosophies. Uh, as a businessman, I can cut expenses or I can grow revenues. And my philosophy has always been, let's grow revenues. Um, uh, I'm not for increased taxes. Uh, no one in this room wants to pay more taxes. But we, as a state, we have a crumbling infrastructure. Uh, I can tell you in the government. Um, we we have we have an IT system that is 10 to 20 years old. The governor doesn't even address that. Um, I would love to see us do a uh, high-speed train. And you say, well, that's really crazy. Well, it's not so crazy because if we were to build a backbone in this state, um, why couldn't we attract major industries from other areas of the country? Um, this is the West. It's open. Uh, Detroit is crumbling. Uh, New York has got uh, Comrade uh, uh, de Blasio in charge, uh, probably San Francisco as well. But I think you see the point. I'm not for I'm not for growing for increasing taxes. What I am for is focusing on those expenses we need to do, but also focusing on the futures. And because we're a government, we have to look at our revenue sources. Uh, revenue sources should not be taxes that we as Nevadans have rejected. Uh, but they should be ways to grow the revenue, to grow the state, to grow the state's economy that will create the type of culture and society that we had growing up, that Ron's kids have now, and that our grandkids will have in the future. So I, I, I know it's not a totally satisfactory answer, but that's, that's where I see it going. We have time for one more. Okay, Lauren, and then we're going to have the drawing. Okay. Like most people in this room, I really don't like the word taxes, even if you use revenue as opposed to taxes, but I'm very involved with biomass and renewable energy and such. There's a lot of untapped natural resources in the matter that could be charged for a fee, not a tax, that if those resources were developed and exploited for revenue, you wouldn't increase tax, but you'd have the revenue you need through energy production, biomass utilization. There's lots of ways of using the resources we have to generate revenue without raising taxes. Uh, I'm all for that. I mean, if, if you, uh, again, I try to be a political realist, and uh, if we can do that, fine. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, my question is, um, can we do that with the resources we have now? So I leave that for all of you to ponder uh, as we do our drawings. So Ron's going to have a final one here, I think. Thank you, Lauren, for that question. And thank you, Dan, for the opportunity. I'll just come back to the most fundamental thing. We have not been in the sweet spot in terms of spending and taxes relative to our economy literally since the Eisenhower administration. And what I advocate in the controller's report is let's grow government slower than the economy. Let's get back to that point where we've got rapid economic growth by having restrained regulation, restrained spending, and restrained taxes. I think that's where we need to go. Dan's really good on a lot of the details, and 
the truth is, I think the most important thing he said was, let's get back to economic growth. And if we do that, we will have for my daughter, for your grandchildren, for all of our children, the kind of future that we were privileged to grow up with. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, both of you. Okay, this is really fun. Get your tickets out, all that entered in the raffle. I almost feel like a Democrat. I'm giving away someone else's money. <laughs> all right, so what we have now, the first drawing is going to be Bill Conrad donated a bottle of wine for us. Bill, would you come draw the ticket since you were so nice to donate that to us? Like I said, Bill donated this to us, and the winning ticket is 5859. If you don't say anything, I'm going to take it. It's mine. 5859. No? Okay, Ray, would you do it, please? Since he can't read it, I'll read it for you. 5693. Oh, oh boy, we have a winner. <laughs> come, come, come get your prize. There you go. Thank you. I believe you. I believe you. Okay. okay, and the next one is for those we reward you for paying early. That really helps our bookkeeping by you going online and paying. So that really helps us. And Ron, would you pick the winner? Uh, right now, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what we're going to do? I'll tell you what. Since you were bribing them, we'll go ahead and why don't we, um, Bill, why don't you... You want to ask for, an, give, give us a number. We're going to do this a little different. Yeah, name, give us a number. A number? Uh, six. Number six. Okay. Okay, Charlene Bybee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now the next one that we're going to give away is 50 50. I appreciate all of you that bought the raffles. And we collected $80, so the winner's going to get 40 Dan, would you pick the winner? I think the winning number is 5531. I'm going to take it if you don't come up. Oh, no way. Oh, this is fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we have her forever. <laughs> oh, the GI dogs? Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. She's donating it to the GI dogs. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ray. He's going to give you some information about the GI dogs and conclude our meeting. Thank you. I think the GI dogs, a couple of the women's group, isn't that right, Marion, or what are sponsoring, and it's, they have pet dogs that are for the veterans that help them. So it's a nice contribution. We'll make sure it gets them. And you can say and ask questions to these two guys because I know they're not tired because tomorrow the governor apologized. He couldn't be here, but they. <laughs> He's got to get ready for tomorrow at 1 o'clock. Next month on the 21st is a Tuesday. We don't have firmed up two speakers, but it might be an evening meeting. Normally it'd be a luncheon, but there are two very good speakers like we had this time, and it's on the 21st. We might even have to change the date depending on the speakers, but we have a lineup for the next few months of some very interesting, controversial speakers. I thank you for coming. Please take the time, socialize, ask these guys questions. 
and let's give him a round of applause. Trying to get a contribution. I'm trying to get on the board. Randy got a bill go down with one, like two other men. They, they couldn't even get a second. Yeah. 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 And I would say, fine. You know, you don't want me on the board. You take the 12 billion. I mean, I don't have to be on the board. You take responsibility. For the no, no, it's just gone up. Good, yeah, thank you. No, good question. Yeah, no, good. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I can tell you even our office. I mean, I, when I got into office, yeah, I mean, I, I, I you're absolutely right. I mean, I came in and I. Yeah. 